Colossians 4, 5, and 6, live wisely among those who are not believers. And make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Now, I'm curious how many of us in this room have heard the phrase, I'm a Christian, but I cannot be a part of an organized church anymore. You ever heard that? Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, if, you've, if you were nodding your head, can you, can you think of some reasons? Um, think of some reasons that you were given why the people in your life who might consider themselves to be a follower of Jesus, claim the name Christian, cannot see themselves ever being a part of an organized church again. I tell you what, I'm going to be risky and see if if we can get some engagement here, okay? Uh, And if it falls flat on its face, we'll just laugh at each other and move right on, all right? Uh, Can any of you think of some of those reasons that you've heard that people in your life cannot be a part of an organized church anymore? Can you say it out? You don't need to raise your hand. Yeah? Christians who... Yeah, Christians who go to church are you did you say hypocrites? Okay. Yep, nailed it. Any other reasons that you've seen or, or heard of? What about like snaky pastors? Right? Untrustworthy. Uh, like like you hear the sentiment of like a snaky salesman from leadership, right? I just don't trust organized churches. They're just snaky salesmen. Anything else that you guys can think of? Church hurt, and somebody fa- uh, the church failed them. I heard that. And so they were in a position of need or a p- position of spiritual need, or their family was hurting, and the church failed them, which off- often leads to church hurt. But church hurt can come in a million different ways, right? Like, I had a low season in my life, and I felt rejected by my church. Uh, um, I was in a, a period of doubt. And my church just couldn't handle doubt. All, all great reasons. Like you guys nailed pretty much every single one of them. One of them here that I hear a lot um, when I'm talking to uh, people who, who are in that space is, I don't want to be associated with people who are known for hate. And, and if you've ever heard that one before, that one like just cuts deep, Right? Because in their experience, you know, on top of hypocrites or church hurt or, or doubts that they have, like somehow, some way, the church of Jesus to them has been known for hate and not love. And, and here's the thing. I, I took us there because I, I wanted us to have this common language as we study a beautiful, encouraging, like, pointed, practical passage in the book of Colossians. And, but I took us there because I think, there's, I think there's an issue. I think, are we gonna, and, and, and are we going to solve all these issues for all these people? No, but I, but I think there's something that we can be a part of that maybe will save the person next to you today here at Lake Point Church from writing off organized church for the rest of their life. Maybe. And I think that I think that very simply said that many of these things if Christians looked and acted like Jesus not all but a whole bunch of people would still be a part of small groups Sunday gatherings, and some part of spiritual formation in a local church. Because this this is stuff that cuts deep when we've experienced these kind of disappointments with other Christians. So, So today, in the book of Colossians, in our series that we've called 
living free, we're going to address how do we actually look as Christians? And if we don't look like Jesus, how do we take some first initial steps to deal with it? And we're going to kind of have this picture in our mind of of that chapter 4, verse 2, where it says, let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you'll have the right response for everyone. And we're going to do this all with the metaphor of wearing clothing. So if you haven't already, I would encourage you to scan that code uh, if you want to follow along in the notes, but open your Bibles if you have them to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 is where we're going to be. I'm just going to read it real quick. If you have your Bible and have it open, I would encourage you to read along with me. I'm reading in the New Living Translation. And if you don't, just listen carefully. So Colossians 3, starting in verse 12. This is the word of the Lord. Since God chose you to be holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tender, tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must also forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. Let this message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And if you're following along, uh, chapter 4, verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us too that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I'm here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I can. This is Paul speaking. And then he gives them this admonition. Live wisely among those who are not believers. And make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive, so that you will have the right response. So today we're talking about clothing. And and today we need to talk about first what Paul already addressed a little bit earlier in chapter 3. He says, if you are in Christ, you are already shedding old clothes. Clothing. If you are in Jesus, if Jesus is your Lord, if you're submitted to him, you have already started the process of shedding that old clothing through repentance. And, and let me give you just a, a couple examples of that. This is found in um, Colossians 3, 5 through 9. It, Paul says, put to death. So he's not quite on the clothing analogy yet. He says, put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of, of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off the old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. And now keep in mind, this is a list. We're we're dealing with lists today, and this is just the first of the two lists. 
And anytime we see a list in Scripture, we have to remember this is not exhaustive. We don't, we, we don't need to write all these things down and say, if I put off these things, I look like Christ, period, end of story. He's giving a whole bunch of examples that would be very relevant to this church at this time in their context. And he's talking about the old clothes. So there's a lot more that we're sh- shedding if Jesus is Lord at love. Lord of our lives. And I would, I, would, um, I would propose that it's these types of old clothes that when put Christians put them on or they've kept them on for years, we call that a, a pet sin, something that we haven't let go of and surrendered to Jesus, But oftentimes, like my friend Colleen said, this is what creates like a cognitive dissonance. This is where the word hypocrisy comes up. When we are still wearing our old clothes that are a part of our old nature, when when Jesus has invited us to shed those old clothes and we've chosen chosen to hold on to them, that there's, there's something that happens in the, the people who are watching us, our friends, our family, the people at school, the people at work, who hear us say that we are a Christian, and then we lash out in anger. Or they know that we're addicted to pornographic images. Name, name your thing off the list or outside of the list, but I would propose that, that maybe, just maybe, we need to take seriously the fact that we, we play a part in some people's decision to be, or some people's feelings on if they're attracted to Christ in the name of Jesus or if they find it distasteful. And scripture says in verse 10, right after that list, Paul says, put on your new nature. And be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Now, if you attend Lake Point, if you're new, thanks for being here. We're so happy you're here. If if, uh, we we hope that you you start to find um, a spiritual community, we hope that you start to make attending Sunday morning gatherings, like part of your spiritual rhythms and practices. Um, And we hope that you grow to become more like Jesus as you seek him both privately and in community. And if you're a part of Lake Point and you've been a part for a while, hopefully you've heard the word discipleship. And that's what I just read. I just read part of the definition of what we would consider discipleship looks like. Verse 10 a new nature, renewed as you learn to know your creator, we call that being with Jesus, and becoming like him. So it's not just about shedding, it's also about putting new clothes on, because we go back to the thing that we're most familiar with, don't we? We shed an old clothing of sin and we don't replace it with the new clothing that we find in Christ, we will oftentimes run back to that old sin. But this is the hope. This is the living free that we're talking about, that in Christ, when we are with him, when we're rooted in him, as John 15 says, that we become more like him. So, shed. We call that partially the, the practice of surrender. If you guys remember that analogy from Easter uh, with the dragon that shed his scales, if you don't remember that, go back and watch it on, on YouTube. We shed clothing, sinful clothing, in the practice of surrender, and we put on new clothing. So let's go to that list uh, start, that starts in verse 12. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to present it in multiple different translations so that we can see 
as many words as, as we can to help us understand. So let's start with a message. Um, first of all, compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength. I love that, quiet strength, discipline, content with second place, forgiving quickly, and love is the all-purpose garment. And the New International Version, remember, this is our scriptures are translated from Greek, so, so there are little nuances that are different in each one. Compassion's the same. Kindness is the same. Humility. How about gentleness? How about patience? What about this word picture? Bear with each other. You can just imagine like, like a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old, like, just, just put up with them. Just bear with your brother here, okay? Like, like, you can see that in this language. Bear with each other, forgiving and love. A New Living Translation says, tender-hearted mercy. I love that one. That one's probably my favorite. Tender-hearted mercy. Could that be said of us? Kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Allowance for each other's faults like that. Allowance for each other's faults. Forgive offenses and love. And then we saw just a moment ago in chapter four, wise living, attractive speech. And these are the things that we put on. Now, I just, I just want to invite us to all to take stock. We, don't, we didn't encourage you to bring journals, so we're going to do a little exercise together. I want you to close your eyes. We'll all close our eyes. And I want you to imagine two people talking. One of them knows you well and the other doesn't. These two people are talking about you. And the person who knows you well is trying to describe what you're like. Now I'm going to read, keep your eyes closed. I'm going to read through these words, and I want you to imagine whether or not the person who knows you well could use them to describe you. Tender-hearted. Kind. Humble. Gentle. Gracious when others screw up. Forgiving. Wise. Someone you want to be around. Keep your eyes closed for just a second. I want you to picture that word that it, your friends wouldn't say of you. Hold that word for just a moment. You can open your eyes. If there wasn't a word in there, like that you're like, I'm not sure if they would say that about me, then your word is probably humility, you know? My attempt at a dry joke. Um, have you ever tried to pick up a new hobby, like try to become a, a, like a runner, or like maybe you're a musician and you've tried to like become a songwriter, or maybe write a story like in prose, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a book, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become a professional pickleballer. I don't know what your hobby is. My hobby is coffee, which just means I spend too much money on coffee and coffee equipment. So, my poor wife. Um, there's there's a there's a book and it, and that talks about like um, the habits that form us. It's it's called Atomic Habits. It's not like bent toward like anything Christian. It's just a guy talking about his observations. Um, about how to form new habits that help you become the person that you want to be. And he talks about runners, for example. And he says runners don't just run miles and miles a day. Runners, he deconstructs it, puts on 
runners put on running shoes every day to go running. And runners set a certain time of day or evening that they know that they can do that, and they set that aside because it's important to them. And he goes through uh, multiple different scenarios of, of, of people who, who have something like running that they aspire to do. And he says, what, what you need to do to form a habit around that is, is, is you need to start becoming the kind of person who puts their running shoes on every day, who sets aside time, who has it on their calendar, who has achievable goals. And he goes, he goes through a whole bunch of things. Anytime we have something that we aspire to, we need to ask ourselves the question, this is where I agree with James Clear, how do I become the kind of person who, and in our case, um, is loving or is known for tender-hearted mercy or name whatever it is that is an attribute of Jesus that you just want to be like? And so I would ask the question, how do we do this? How do we become the kind of person who is known for whatever that one thing is that your friends couldn't say, oh, yeah, Jane, she's, she's, very, she's very kind, but I would not call her patient, right? Like, like, whatever that was for you, how do we become that kind of person? So let's back up and talk about this beautiful book of Scripture that we're studying. All of this, all, all of this that we're reading is written in the context to, to, to a real church who's experiencing real spiritual growth. And over the last three weeks, I just want to quick recap what we've talked about because I think that can inform how we become this, this kind of people, people who are known for these kinds of things. Uh, last three weeks, we've been in the book of Colossians, Pastor Cammie, Pastor Brian, and then Pastor Ed covered different aspects of this letter in Scripture, and each of them touched on the fact that this letter is designed to guide faithful believers to a correct understanding of who they are in Christ. Brian spoke about the freedom, uh, oh, actually, Going back, Cami spoke first, and she spoke about the freedom to live outside of, uh, like outside and inside pressures uh, of all the shoulds that surround us as 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 parents specifically, um, and even the freedom for children and teens to view obedience as like a training ground for obeying God, obedience to their parents as a training ground. So that's that's where where Cammie brought uh, the freedom of Christ into those contexts. Brian spoke about the freedom to live in confidence in a world that will try to tug you away from Christ, where he kind of cast a vision for our graduating seniors like, hey, listen, you're ready. You are ready. Live in Christ. Have confidence in what Jesus has given you. And then last week, Pastor Ed came and he spoke about the freedom to be a worker or a boss that reflects Christ. And all of, us, all of these things, we, we, could, we could spend months in this little letter in Scripture. All of these things come back to the foundation of who Jesus is, who Jesus is to us, and who Jesus is to the world at large. And I just want to read real quick the, the foundation of this book, which is absolutely critical to our understanding of who Jesus is and who we are reflecting, the glory and majesty of this Jesus that we claim. Chapter 1 of Colossians, starting in verse 15, says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created. He is supreme over all creation. 
for through him, for through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, the supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live, to dwell in Christ. And through God, God, or through him, God bought back everything to himself. He made peace everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Remember, it's that same Jesus that we're called in chapter 3 that invites us to be with him and become like him. So I guess what I'm saying is Rather than heaping shame on the word or words that, that you identified just a few moments ago that do not describe you, the invitation is not to, to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, to try harder. The invitation of Jesus is simply to be with him, become like. So how do we do that? There's a million ways. But today I'm going to bring out what's in the passage, uh, not the gazillion other ways that we talk about being with Jesus and becoming like him. We did a whole sermon series in the fall about um, the practice of Scripture. We're going to do other sermon series about the other uh, spiritual practices or disciplines that that lead us to becoming more like Christ. But today I'm, I'm just going to cover one way. The how. How do we become kind, the kind of people that reflect Christ in all these areas? All right. I was I almost I was tempted to skip this, but I think you guys need I think we need the word picture. Um gonna skip this. We're talking about things on the inside being manifest on the outside. Okay, so we talked about compassion, love, patience, all these things. Like, imagine those as clothes, and then I want you to bring yourself back to junior high. Some of you are, like, in middle school right now, so, like, bring yourself back to right now. Um, I want you to imagine, like, the time that you decided that you were going to adopt a, a particular style. Can you, like, do you root for me? Um, it was baggy jeans. Joel, can you show? Yeah. Ooh. See, like, I, I, I wanted to express myself, right? Like, Really what I was doing is trying to fit in. But like, I wanted to be cool, right? Like, I felt cool on the inside. I wanted to be seen as cool. And and that moved on. Like, that matured into something ridiculous like flannel in the 2010s and like wearing beanies that were not quite on your head Um, and growing bigger beards than this dude because I don't know if he's actually hit puberty or if that's peach fuzz, you know? And, and, and... Like, then there was, like, then now I'm, like, a 40-year-old, like, trying to express myself, but, like, trying to not be out of style, but not be cringy at the same time. Anybody relate to that? Like, like nobody, nobody really wants to be, uh, how about that next picture? Like, I don't, mm, I can't pull that off, and I'm not, I'm not going to try. Like, not 100%. And, 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 like, that's skipping over the whole skinny jeans era. Like, some people still think like skinny jeans are in, they're not. Um, The point is, 
what's on the outside is a reflection of what's on the inside and how we desire to see ourselves. That I, I felt like I could move on, but the pictures were there and they're worth seeing just because they make you roll your eyes. All right, let's talk about how. Let's talk about how. Let's, let's move on to how do we become this kind of person. And in the book of Colossians, I would propose the how is simply thanksgiving. So I'm, I'm just going to go real quick through the book of Colossians. Starting in chapter 1, we see we always pray for you and give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Heard about your faith and your love for all God's people. So that's the first time he mentions it's not a command, that's just like the word thanks, but whole bunch. Chapter 1, verse 11, may you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. Again, thankfulness, talking about how God has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. Chapter 2. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth as you were taught, and you will overflow with what? Thankfulness. Um, Chapter 3, verse 15. For as members of one body, you're called to live in peace and always be thankful. Sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs with thankful hearts. Whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of, of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Then lastly, that verse we read earlier, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a heart. What I would say is this, just throwing out a word isn't that all that helpful. So let, let me just kind of um, invite you to what Jesus has given me and he's filled me up with and what thankfulness can look like and, and becoming something that fills us up so that we overflow to others. For me, what thankfulness looks like, um, it's more than just reframing. I'm really good at reframing things and like, like you know, making a bad situation good. It's more than just that for me. Um, it's It's... When I'm encountering something hard, that I sit in the hard and I find a way to thank God. Now, sometimes, if I'm being honest, I can't thank God for the hard, whatever that hard is. Actually, oftentimes, I can't do that until after the fact. Maybe you've experienced that in your life as well. But, but I sit with God in the hard and I thank him for where he's been good in the past. So I meet God in his goodness, and I spend, even if it's just a little bit of time, it's at least acknowledging, but you have been good. This is hard, but you have showed up in this way, and I trust you. Even if I don't feel that trust in the moment, like I say the words, I say the words until my heart catches up with that. So that, That's just one idea. Uh, another idea would actually be um, what Pastor Brian talked about in our the, uh, Practice of Surrender series, which is something called Eximen, uh, where, where we go, or it's, it, I, like the, I like to pronounce it examine because it make, makes more sense. Um, the, the practice of sitting at the end of, a, of the week and going through your week like, you know, like it's a, like it's a rewound, rewound reel. Like you can see what God did throughout that week. And you sit in that and, and you place that before God, how that makes you feel. Now, I would encourage you, if you have adopted that practice, to then make a gratefulness list. Very simple. It might even sound cheesy to you, but... I would, I would encourage you, if, if you've never done that in your examine process, like you start to list the things that you're grateful for about a week or even if you get microscopic a day, you're going to be shocked with how 
after a rough week or a rough day, thanking God like in a list format will reshape some of those feelings. It might not change the feelings completely, but it will start to reshape and reform. So those are just two ideas. There, there could be like adding part of your daily practice. Like if you really struggle with your job, thanking God for your job before you start every shift and taking 10, 20 seconds to stop before you drive in the car home to thank God for your job at the end of the workday. Or maybe like you're in that season of parenting where like you're the person who's working outside of the home and you have to come to chaos when you come home and you thank God before you walk into the chaos for your family. Or if you're like a teenager or a, a student here and like you really struggle with your parents right now, like having that as part of your practice before you walk in the door of thanking God for, for your family, thanking God for what he's given you in your family, finding those little moments to thank God. And what does that do? That turn starts to turn in our hearts something that's real, something that's beautiful, because we're not like making things up. We're churning up the real, the beautiful things. And what God does with that, as we churn up those things of his goodness given to us, we start to find ourselves lighter. We start to find ourselves more pleasant to be around. Can you imagine if, if every day that was churned up in you before work, even if you're ready to go like take out one of your coworkers because they're a pain in the butt, or your family, name the situation. Can you imagine that word that your friend could not say about you, how that could change with a thankful and grateful heart. Remember, just like uh, the style of our clothing is an attempt for us to express who we are on the inside, thankfulness is that inside that is expressed through the clothing of all these beautiful things. It's not pull yourself up by your bootstrap. It's surrender to the beauty that Jesus already has in your life. So let's circle back to what we hear as we share our faith that I believe in Jesus, but I can't be a part of an organized church. And we, we pull the string, we ask the questions. I know what's at stake is none of us want that. None of us want to be the hypocrite that has, has turned someone away from faith. But I also know that, that if you're in this room and you're seeking Jesus, you know that, that it's harder than just like pressing a button and making a decision and becoming a person of love. And at Lake Point, our goal is to be a community that points people to Jesus in everyday life and everyday relationship. And, and we do that, like Brian, Brian drew a whole bunch of circles a few weeks ago, and I've got a really sped up version of that. And like, like he talked about how, how people aren't going to come, many people will never come into that center part, that church part. Um, and, 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 and yet they, we know that they need to experience Jesus. So, so what's at stake, would I ask in this conversation? I believe what's at stake is a whole bunch of people who need to experience Jesus at work in our neighborhoods and our networks. I can't even read that. Why one? Youk. Youth. <laughs> School. Fun. <laughs> I love Brian's sloppy handwriting sometimes. I believe that what's at stake is the name of Jesus in our community. It's not just us looking good or feeling good about ourselves. I believe that if we live free in Christ, that yeah, it'll probably result in people in your circles 
coming to Lake Point and experiencing something here. I, I don't I don't know necessarily what that looks like, but but yeah, it'll probably result in that. But I know, but I know that the name of Jesus, as we practice gratefulness in our lives, in whatever way we need to to practice gratefulness, and as what bubbles up within me are things like compassion, tenderhearted, mercy, patience, kindness, love, wisdom, grace gracious speech that's attractive. The things that bubble up in us will pour out into our community. That's what's at stake. People seeing Jesus in you and through you. Claim the name of Jesus. I know that that's what you want as well. Next week, we're going to continue this um, series, and I'm going to pray us out. Uh, So I'd invite you to stand as I pray us out today. And pray a blessing over each one of you as, as, we, as we take these words of Scripture and hopefully let God bubble up within us these beautiful things through the practice of gratefulness. Father, in the name of Jesus, we submit ourselves before you knowing that these are the things uh, that we cannot muster. We cannot even muster gratefulness on our own, that we need to be led and get guided by your Holy Spirit. But I ask, Father, that as we practice gratefulness this week, I ask that you would open up our minds, open up our eyes to see the beautiful things that you are currently doing and the beautiful things that you have done in the past so that our faith would grow and that we would bubble over, spill over with a, a, a gracious and attractive being in our community, that each one of us would bubble up with love and kindness in a way that helps people see Jesus either in a new way or for the first time. We pray this and we submit ourselves to you in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen. Have a great week.